In this video uh, lecture, we are going to be talking about management of the surgical wound. This is chapter 21 in our Fuller's textbook. If you would like to take a little virtual field trip, I did create some Quizlet uh, cards for you regarding the terminology at the front of the chapter. So if you would like to review that either now or at some time after reviewing this lecture, go ahead and just go to the Blackboard, click on the Resources tab on the left hand side. Uh, once you're there, navigate to the content folder that says Chapter 21 Supplemental Resources. And in that folder, you'll find um, an item that is titled Review Chapter 21 Terminology. That will take you to the Quizlet review of the terminology for the chapter. So let's talk a little bit about wound management. There are several concepts that we need to think about when we are um, talking about wound management. And the first thing is to protect the wound from contamination, right? Sterile technique first and foremost. Also, we want to control bleeding. Exposure of the wound is also going to help the surgeon to be able to see what he or she is doing so that hopefully they can do it in an efficient and effective manner, right? The, the, the less time that we can have the patient under anesthesia and exposed to the environment of the operating room, the better. Protecting the tissues is also something really important. This is why we want to make sure that the Bovi pencil always stays in that little plastic holder, that all sharps are picked up immediately from the field if they get placed on the field, um, and that the site is also cleared of instruments so that we don't accidentally um, damage uh, the tissue um, in any other way. Contributing to tissue viability um, means, you know, if, if we're doing a long procedure, the tissues are going to start to dry out. So are we covering those with um, tissues with moistened laps or are we irrigating them with some saline to make sure that they stay hydrated? Also, um, eliminating dead space. So this doesn't have so much to do with us as the surgeon, but that dead space that I was talking about on our previous lecture, where if we remove um, a hunk of tissue and there is a big empty void, that space is gonna fill with fluid and cause a seroma. And we don't want that because we don't get tissue healing when we have a seroma. So filling that dead space, so surgeon's gonna be concerned with that. Keep your eyeballs out for it. Um, and then lastly, more specific to the surgeon is restoration of tissue planes and edges. Um, you know, when they're suturing up the wound, when we're putting in the skin staples, those kinds of things we have to be aware of, um, getting those edges um, against one another to promote healing. Okay, so that brings us to this gentleman, William Halstead. And uh, I, I like this little, this little snippet here. It says, the answer to the problem came from America in the form of rubber gloves. William Halstead, a leading surgeon, started using them when his girlfriend and nurse complained of dry hands from the carbolic acid. He then introduced caps, masks, and gowns for surgery. Uh, fast forwarding down the line, um, about 100 years back, um, he also established something called the Halstead's Principles of Surgery. And this has to do with handling tissue. William Halstead recognized that if we focused on these essential components during surgery, that we would have a better chance of getting the patient's wounds to heal. And that first thing is handling tissue gently, right? They can be easily damaged. So we want to make sure that we don't allow them to dry out, that we don't handle them any more than we have to. We don't tug, push, pull, or prod on them any more than we have to. Controlling bleeding as efficiently as possible. Um, the more blood we lose, the um, 
the dire, the more dire the outcome is for the patient. So hemostasis is definitely an important thing. Also preserving blood supply. We don't want to cut and divide and ligate vessels if we don't have to, right? So we're gonna minimize that. Observing strict aseptic technique, we've talked about numerous times. Minimizing tissue tension. So, um, you know, when uh, the surgeon is suturing the tissues, they want to make sure that there's not too much of a pull or a strain or a stress on the tissues. This is where retention stitches sometimes come in, and we'll look at those later on in the lecture. And then that elimination of dead space is also a part of Halstead's principles. So history and tissue protection, again, 100 years ago, William Halstead developed these principles. Um, the sad news is, is that approximately one in 25 patients develops um, a, a surgical site infection or some sort of health uh, uh, care acquired infection. And so, um, practicing strict aseptic technique is essential. In order to contribute to wound healing, we also want to make sure we're focusing on protecting the tissue. And some of the ways that we can do that is by preventing in injury, wound irrigation, and retraction. So as far as preventing injuries, we want to make sure that we anticipate um, the proper instrumentation and also the proper use of instrumentation. Okay, um, keeping the field clean, again, making sure that there aren't any sharps on the field, that the bovi is in its holster, that there isn't anything that's going to accidentally poke or stab or um, burn the patient. Um, this also goes for when we're doing uh, laparoscopies or arthroscopies. That light source that we use becomes concentrated at the end of the scope, and that can burn the patient just like a cigarette burn. It can burn right through the drapes as well. So we want to watch those things as well. Um, we also want to make sure that we don't lean or rest on the patient at all. This also includes resting heavy pieces of equipment like saws and drills and reamers and those kinds of things um, on the patient. We want to make sure we never do that. Um, so think about it for a second. What fluid do we typically use to irrigate the wound? Did you guys think of saline when you thought, when you thought of this question? You would be absolutely right. Um, so saline is typically what we use. We want to make sure that we keep tissues moist during the procedure so that they don't dry out and there isn't tissue death. And in some situations, continuous irrigation is going to be used. Examples are when we're doing some sort of arthroscopy. We're looking in the knee, the ankle, the wrist, those kinds of things. Um, also, when we're doing cystoscopies or hysteroscopies, continuous irrigation is going to be a thing. This is going to help distend that area where we're working. It's also going to help with hemostasis as well and assist with visualization. Now, retraction. Two different types. You guys already know this, handheld and self-retaining. Um, you know, we want to select retractors according to how deep of a wound we, we are in or how, um, um, how big the incision is, is something else, right? So um, even if we don't know the name of the instrument and, uh, you know, the surgeon asks for something and it's a very small wound, then you can kind of anticipate just by looking at the size of the wound and looking at the size of the the retractors that you have, what retractor would make sense, okay? Um, some other things besides retractors that you might see sometimes used are vessel loops or Penrose drains. And we're gonna see a picture of Penrose coming up, but um, 
Vessel loops and Penrose drains are just little strips and sometimes they will loop those around a vessel or a nerve or the spermatic cord or something like that if they're retracting it or um, to retract it and to also hold some tension um, for one of two reasons. One, either to dissect um, other tissue away from that structure or to safely move it out of the way so that it doesn't get injured intraoperatively. There are two categories of hemostasis that the text talks about. And the first one is mechanical, and the other is biochemical. Now, the mechanical types of hemostasis are concentrated on the left side of this slide, starting with the top left. Those are some lap sponges. There's very uh, various types of sponges. We'll look at some different ones coming up here in a bit. Um, but sponging is a mechanical form of hemostasis, as is stitching or tying or using some sort of instrument like a hemostat or a Mayo peon or a Rochester peon or an Adson tonsil, any of those clamping and occluding type instruments. And then that um, the middle picture there uh, signifies the electrocautery uh, pencil, okay? Uh, the other type is biochemical. So there are a variety of biochemical hemostatic agents. Um, they all basically do the same thing. Some take um, a little bit of preparation from us. Um, if you look at this page on the right, you'll see a surge of flow, and you'll also see one called flow seal. These two types of hemostatic agents come in a little kit, and I have some in the lab that I can show you when the time comes, um, but uh, that kit will get dispensed to our field, and then it's our responsibility to, um, you know, mix up the hemostatic agent, get it into the syringe, and get it to the surgeon. Other things like gel foam and Surgicel, um, they come as like a, a little foam pad or a little piece of like material that looks like silk and those can just be laid right on the area that is bleeding. So these are some good examples of biochemical means of um, hemostasis. And remember, hemostasis just means to control the bleeding. So two main ways we do that mechanical methods and biochemical methods. Another uh, option that the surgeon has when they're working on an extremity to control bleeding is a pneumatic tourniquet. And this kind of looks like a blood pressure cuff. Um, some of them are sterile, some are not. But um, if you look in your book on page 431, you can see a pretty good depiction of how this pneumatic tourniquet is placed on a thigh. It can also go on the arm as well. And its job is to give a big squeeze to prevent blood from flowing down the extremity past the pneumatic tourniquet. The other image that you see in your textbook is like a big stretchy band that they're wrapping around the extremity and this purpose uh, that that this um, stretchy band serves is to start at the most distal part of the extremity hand or foot and wrap really tightly this stretchy band all the way up to the current tourniquet before they inflate it and then once they, um, they, they do that, they've essentially squeezed most of the blood out of the tissue. We call this exsanguination. And the, um, the stretchy band is called an S-mark, E-S-M-A-R-K, S-mark. And so the S-mark is used to squeeze the blood out of the extremity to exsanguinate it up to the level of the tourniquet. 
then the tourniquet gets inflated and that is going to reduce blood flow to the area that we're working. Now there's a finite amount of time that we can keep the tourniquet up. Um, the book suggests that for an extremity, after one and a half to two hours, um, or for one hour on an upper extremity and an, an hour and a half to two hours on a lower extremity. After that, the tourniquet should be deflated and there should be some time that passes before it gets reinflated if we are continuing to work in that area. Um, so definitely another option that the surgeon can use uh, when working on an extremity. Some other hemostatic agents um, that we might not have touched on, um, and you can see here there are different categories or um, the materials that they're made of. So there's absorbable gelatin, which is the gel foam that we saw. There's also gel film and surgifoam. Um, oxidized cellulose is the, the name brand for that is called Surgicel. There's also collagen absorbable hemostat, and that is Avatine. And then there's also bone hemostatic agents called bone wax or bone putty. And um, as we go through our uh, journey together further into this and we get into our specialty chapters, that's where we're going to look at more of these different types of hemostatic agents. Uh, here is uh, an example of an active hemostatic agent. So the, uh, the previous ones were mechanical. This one is considered an active hemostat and it stimulates the body's own coagulation process. And this is thrombin. And thrombin comes in a powder in the vial and then it gets reconstituted with some injectable saline and typically it is used in conjunction with gel foam. Um, other types, Surgiflow, Surgiseal, you saw pictures of those. And there's different types of sealants as well. Um, for organs or tissues like the liver, the spleen, the lungs, vessels, esophagus, or the dura, um, these fibrin seals are, um, are really effective. Again, they uh, get delivered to the field in a kit, and then it is our responsibility to put them together. Um, I think there are uh, little diagrams on the kit packaging as well, so that's helpful. Uh, here's a picture of Flow Seal. You can see all of the fun stuff that it comes with. Here's some different types of sponges and we're going to be working with each of these in the lab at one point or another. You should be familiar with Raytex already. They're the top left. Uh, over on the top right, um, those are Raytex or those are lap sponges, excuse me. In the middle, we have our tonsil sponges. Good for taking out tonsils. Bottom left is going to be our peanuts or kittners. They come in packs of five. And then over on the bottom, right are neuro sponges or neuro patties they're called and they come in different sizes but these are for like spine and um, uh, like craniotomies and stuff like that there's a Raytech, our peanut our tonsil our lap sponge and our neuro patties so let's talk about suture. Suture is a big topic, and we are only going to scratch the surface here. Um, and uh, you're going to continue learning about suture, just like you're going to continue learning about instruments as you continue through the program and on into your clinicals and way into your career. This is a continuous process for learning about different suture types. Um, so let's look at some different properties of sutures. So sutures, uh, one thing we take into consideration is the physical aspect of the suture. The physical aspect could be its size 
or the material that it is made out of. The tensile strength. The tensile strength, it has to do with how strong the suture is, okay? Um, if you were to pull on it really hard, is it gonna snap or is it not? Okay, so how strong it is. Whether it um, absorbs fluid or not, okay? Um, so if the, um, if the suture is made of some type of material that is like a sewing thread, um, that is going to have something called capillary action. And capillary action or wicking action means that fluid can travel along the length of that suture. If it is a, and that's typically multi-filament uh, sutures. Uh, they're like a thread. Uh, monofilament sutures are like a fishing line and those do not have capillary action. Fluid cannot travel along those types of um, sutures. Um, handling quality uh, and knot strength are two other properties that surgeons consider when they're choosing what suture to use. Um, the knot strength, um, when we have sutures that are monofilament, like a fishing line, their knot strength is not very good. So um, if you were ever to take a fishing line and tie it in a knot and then kind of pull on the loop or pull on the ends, it does have a tendency to slide. Whereas if you tied some yarn or some thread, it probably wouldn't be as likely to do that. So knot strength is definitely going to be a thing. Memory is also a thing. With our fishing line type sutures, our monofilaments, they have a tendency to have more memory, which means when you pull it out of the package, it's going to hold its shape. And we're, uh, the surge tack is, is going to be responsible for pulling that memory out of the suture so that it's not all crazy like when you give it to the surgeon. Um, its plasticity and its pliability also lend themselves to the handling abilities um, or the handling quality of the suture. Um, and then there's also its bioactivity. And bioactivity has to do with how the body reacts to the suture. Now, any type of suture that we put into the body is going to be recognized as a foreign body or a foreign material. But those sutures that are made of biological materials like silk or cat gut, um, something that occurs uh, naturally, then the body is going to have a higher reactivity to those types of sutures than it would to um, a synthetic material. And when we have sutures that um, where there's not a lot of inflammation or there's no inflammation caused by the suture, we say that it is highly inert, E-N-E-R-T, inert. And that means uh, that it causes little or no inflammation. And stainless steel, titanium, and polypropylene sutures are some of the more inert sutures that we will use. Again, the physical characteristics of sutures. We have monofilament, which is one strand, like a fishing line, or multifilament, which is multiple strands braided together like a uh, thread, a sewing thread. And those multifilaments can be twisted or braided together, okay? And um, as far as the variables for suture selection, some other things that the surgeon's going to think of. The surgeon's going to think of the type of tissue that it's being used on also going to think about the strength or the lasting ability 
of the suture. So if the surgeon wants to repair a hernia or a tendon, he's going to want to make sure that that holds up for a long time. So he's going to choose a suture that doesn't absorb quickly. Okay, so uh, two types of sutures, absorbable and non-absorbable, in addition to monofilament or multifilament. So absorbable or non-absorbable, that has to do with the comp composition. Um, other things that the surgeon might think about is the requirement for scar formation. Um, believe it or not, there are some times when the surgeon wants there to be more inflammation or more scarring. An example could be in the urinary tract. Um, they're going to think about the risk of infection. If there is a high risk of infection, they're probably going to avoid sutures with capillary action because if with capillary action, if, um, if one area of the wound gets infected, then that fluid from the infection could potentially travel along that suture and infect the rest of the wound. Um, and then a couple other things, skin, um, you know, the, the area uh, the, where the skin is, um, the quality of the skin, those kinds of things, we're gonna think about that. Um, and then also cosmetic closures as well. Here is the suture chart that I put together. Um, and if you look on pages 438 through uh, 440, it is gonna give you a list of a variety of different types of sutures, um, as well as their composition, their different sizes, their structure, their handling, those kinds of things. Um, and we'll be reviewing more, on, and more and more of these as we go in the program. But here is a good chart that I put together, and it really uh, gives you an idea of the different characteristics of sutures and how they kind of come together. So if you look at the left, you'll see multifilament and monofilament uh, characteristics. And then the top, you see absorbable and non-absorbable. So you can have an absorbable suture that is a monofilament or an absorbable suture that is a, uh, a multifilament. You can also have the same with non-absorbable, but you can't have something that absorbs and doesn't absorb at the same time. Also, you are not going to have a, a, a suture that has monofilament and multifilament characteristics. Okay, so it's either going to have, uh, it's going to absorb or it's not, and or it's going to be more than one strand or it's not. So if you look at this chart, you can see the different characteristics regarding um, uh, the pros and cons of all of the different suture characteristics. Um, you can also see some examples. So as we move from the top um, absorbable category, um, absorbable means it's gonna dissolve over time and that is dependent upon the type of suture, the composition of the suture. Some sutures are gonna dissolve more quickly than other sutures do. Um, and you can see the examples here and whether they're synthetic or biological. Here you're looking at a suture needle and a suture needle, believe it or not, does have anatomy. So the, um, the eye of the needle is over here where it says it's swage, okay? So this word swage, or we say swedge, I say swedged, swedged on. Um, this used to be the eye back in the old days and infrequently now, but there uh, are needles that have an eye in the back of them, but we pretty much don't use those anymore. We use what we call swedged on, and where I circled here, that's where the suture thread fits into the back of this hollow needle, and it gets crimped. Um, uh, they'll crimp the metal of the needle, and that is what holds the suture on. Okay, so way, um, way over at the other end is the point. Okay, over here, that's the needle point. 
and in between the point and the swedge is the body, okay? Now, um, needles are going to vary in length, uh, in size, and in thickness as well. And this kind of goes in line with the tissue that we're suturing. So if we're suturing really heavy, thick tissue, it's probably gonna be a heavier, thicker, bigger needle. But if we're suturing really delicate, fine tissue, then it's probably gonna be a finer needle. Here we have a suture package. I just wanted you to get a peek at this as far as um, what a label looks like. Um, so you can see the gauge of suture, and we'll talk about that in a second in more detail, but this is a 3-0 Vicryl suture. Vicryl is a multi-filament absorbable suture, and you can see this one says it was sterilized with ethylene oxide. This SH right here tells you the type of needle, and this picture is the actual size of the needle. It also tells you something else, that it is a taper needle. Well, there's a variety of needles that the surgeon might use. There's ones that have a cutting point or cutting edge, and there's others that taper to just a point. Um, there are also spatula needles, which are, are kind of flat, and they have a cutting edge as well. And so we'll look at some of these in the lab. Um, this number over here, this J416, is actual a reorder number. Okay. There are several different types of suturing techniques that the surgeon could choose to use. And one of the, the first ones that the book talks about is continuous um, suturing technique. So, um, a continuous can be a subcuticular stitch, a purse string stitch, or a locking stitch. But continuous means that they are going to take a bite uh, on one side of the incision, tie a knot, and then continue looping the suture through the tissue until they get all the way to the other end. Maybe like sewing up a hem on a uh, a sleeve or a pant leg. Um, a locking stitch is going to be a stitch that adds additional strength to the running suture line. And um, there are some newer types of sutures that are considered self-locking. They actually have these little tiny barbs on one, um, in one direction on the suture. And it's really important that you don't run your fingers down the suture because that could damage the integrity of that locking, um, <clears throat> that barbed suture. A subcuticular stitch, remember, is going to be placed in that subcuticular layer um, where the dermis meets the adipose. <clears throat> And then the opposite of continuous would be interrupted, where there's uh, the surgeon's gonna put a stitch, you're gonna cut it, they're gonna move down a little ways, put another stitch, tie it, you're gonna cut it, so on and so forth. Um, I have an image coming up here on the next slide that you can take a peek at. Um, interrupted suture techniques, um, you know, like I said, can be um, distributed, uh, evenly over the length of the um, of the wound and the wound is going to be closed in layers so um, if we were closing an abdominal wound for example the innermost layer is the peritoneum which would be closed first and then the fascial layer is on top of that and then the adipose and then the skin some other devices that might be used to close a wound are retentions with braces, so retention sutures with braces. Um, uh, a ligature is a tie or a stitch that is used to close off a vessel. Um, 
And then there are various orthopedic anchoring devices to fix tendons, rotator cuffs, those kinds of things. When we have a situation where a soft tissue pulls away from the bone, um, we can use these orthopedic anchors to go ahead and um, reapproximate that soft tissue back to the bone where it belongs. So if you look at this top image here, um, these are the braces. And um, the situation that we would use these is let's say that we have a patient that when they're closing the wound, they are concerned that the tissues are not strong enough and that they may like split open um, and cause a dehiscence. And so they're going to put in retention sutures and they're going to use these bridges to do that. Um, the picture down below that is an example of a chromic tie. That's the the wheel that you see on the um, on this side of the picture here. Um, and this is just suture material that does not have a needle and it can be cut any length the surgeon wants. Um, there are also free ties that are pre-cut into lengths. Um, and then down below here are some different anchoring devices. Here are some different types of stitches like we talked about. Um, this first one here um, is called a, um, a mattress stitch. And um, then you can see different uh, continuous. This is a continuous here. Um, this is the locking stitch right here. This one's the locking stitch. <coughs> Excuse me, you can see how um, it's kind of looped and locked along the side. And then we have a couple different examples of um, interrupted stitches. You can see how uh, these here that I'm underlying in blue, these are all interrupted. Okay, so um, that gives you a visual of the difference between interrupted stitches and running stitches. So let's talk a little bit about the gauge of suture. If you take a look at this image here at the very bottom, you'll notice a 10 slash O. 10-0, suture is the smallest suture that they manufacture. If you were to take a hair from your head and pluck it out and take a look at the diameter of it and imagine half that diameter, we're getting close to the diameter of a 11-0 suture. So as we continue to increase the gauge, these numbers are going to start to get smaller. So 9-0 is bigger than 10-0, 8-0 is bigger than 9-0, 7-0 is bigger than 8-0, so on and so forth, until we get up to um, a 2-0, and then notice what happens right here. We go from 2-0 to 0, and then one would be bigger than zero, two would be bigger than one. Um, there is a size bigger than number two suture and it is number five. Um, and it is a very thick, heavy corded type suture. When we're loading and passing sutures, so uh, a, a needle uh, is loaded on the needle holder and if you look at this top left image uh, where the check mark is, that is a stitch that is properly loaded for a right-handed surgeon. The needle holder needs to be loaded onto the needle about two-thirds of the way from the tip. You don't want to load it onto the swedge area where the suture has been crimped into the back of the needle. 
that could damage the integrity of the needle and the stitch could pull away from that. All right, this would be the opposite for a left-handed surgeon. The needle would be, instead of going in the direction that it's going in, it would be going in this direction instead. Okay, and so we'll learn in our next class together how to load and how to pass a stitch. Uh, there's other top right image is a pretty good image of um, how to load a needle holder for a right-handed surgeon. And then the bottom image shows the passing. Um, and so it's, it, it's important to not only load them properly and pass them safely, but to, to keep track of those needles so that they don't get lost. Um, the more organized you can be, the, the better um, so that a needle doesn't get lost or misplaced or anything like that. Um, you also want to avoid handling needles with your gloved hand. If you can use the needle holder, that's a better practice so that you don't get hurt. And then um, <clears throat> as soon as that needle comes back to you, you want to put it uh, in the needle uh, box, uh, the needle mat, and secure it. Um, so that you don't get injured or poked or anything like that. Um, I, <clears throat> I was also going to mention that um, you want to use the method of give one, take one. So if at all possible, you don't want to pass another stitch to the surgeon until you get that stitch back that he or she has been using. <clears throat> when we're cutting the suture, uh, there's some things that we want to think about. First of all, we want to make sure that we are only using the suture scissor um, to cut suture. When you get ready to cut the suture, you're going the, the best way I have found is to put your thumb and your ring finger in the holes and your first finger out on top of the scissor to kind of stabilize it. You can see in this image here how his thumb is in the one ring, his, um, you can't really tell, but his ring finger is in the other one, and then the middle finger kind of wraps around the top of the ring, and his pointer finger is stabilizing the, uh, the scissor. When you come in to cut the stitch, you want to open the blades ever so slightly, and you want to make sure that you cut with the tip, okay? Um, when you come down on the stitch, you want to turn the scissor at about a 45 degree angle, and then you want to confirm with your surgeon that it is okay to cut it. And when the surgeon says yes, then you cut. And then all of those little bits and pieces of suture that you cut off, you want to make sure that you remove those from the field. <clears throat> so there are various types of tissue implants, drains, and dressings that can be used intraoperatively, and we will get introduced to more of these as we continue, uh, you know, to push ahead and then get into our specialty chapters. Um, but tissue implants can be made of a variety of different types of um, tissues or um, synthetic materials. Um, the, the book talks about allograft, um, an allograft is a tissue that's derived from human tissue, um, but it's not from the patient himself or herself, whereas an autograft or an autologous graft actually comes from the patient uh, themselves. There are also different animal grafts like um, 
graphs from cows or graphs from pigs, so bovine or porcine graphs as well. Um, and then there is also another category of tissue graft called the xenograft, which um, does not come from an animal or a synthetic source. Um, a good example would be coral, okay? Um, other types of materials that we have um, are um, various metals and um, uh, when we're doing hip implants, knee implants, uh, replacements, fractures, those kinds of things, um, those are typically going to be metal uh, screws or plates. Uh, sometimes titanium, could be stainless steel, could be other alloys as well. Um, that uh, polymethyl methacrylate is what they, um, what is used uh, for bone cement. Um, there could also be reabsorbable tissue implants. Um, a good example of this is when we do an ACL repair or reconstruction rather, um, a lot of docs will put an absorbable screw um, in the canal to hold the graft in place. Um, polyethylene is another example. This is kind of like a plastic type of material. Um, implants can also be made of silicone. Breast implants is a good example of this. Um, a few years back, uh, 10, 15 years ago, they took them off the market, the silicone implants. Um, because they were liquid silicone and they were rupturing and that was causing uh, situations. So they um, actually just re-released those types of implants and um, uh, they are now back on the market, but they are a solid consistency and deemed safe for patient use. Different woven synthetic grafts are going to be what we use to do uh, our, our vascular bypasses, um, our aorta bifem bypasses, or our, um, our femoral popliteal bypasses, those kinds of things. So they are going to mimic a vessel, but they are a synthetic uh, woven tube uh, type graft. Um, so there are various different drains. We're going to look at some different ones coming up. So um, suffice it to say there are two um, main categories. There are passive ones which do not have suction attached to them. They just use gravity. And the other type is called an active drain which does have some sort of suction device trapped, uh, attached to it. Um, we'll look at a water seal drainage system as well. Um, and then there's a plethora of dressings that the surgeon could choose to cover the wound. Um, but really, it's to protect the wound, right? That's the job of the dressing. Um, there could be flat dressings and there can be rolled dressings. A lot of times the, the rolled dressings are going to be used on extremities where we have to wrap an arm or a leg or a hand or a foot or something like that. <clears throat> if we are not using a rolled dressing, which is typically held on by like an ace bandage or something, then the dressing will need to be um, taped to the skin. Um, other adhesive dressings like Steri strips are pretty common, um, <clears throat> as well as um, like our skin glue, which is uh, which we refer to as Dermabond, which is a single layer dressing. So there can be a one layer dressing, Dermabond would be a good example, or three layer dressings, which means there's gonna be some sort of layer against the skin, and then a layer that's um, absorbent, and then tape of some kind. Uh, a Band-Aid is a, um, a very simple, representation of a three-layer dressing because you have that little white non-stick center and there's some little uh, a little bit of fluffy cotton padding in there to help absorb um, fluid and then there's the sticky band-aid part so in essence a band-aid is also a three-layer dressing
<clears throat> so here are some different types of drains. This top left one is called a hemovac drain. Um, notice this big metal spike that's attached to the drain that is actually um, used to push through the skin. And um, when, when you're um, helping the surgeon put in a hemovac drain, you want to have a coker ready. Um, that's a, a kind of a, a good heavy instrument to help pull that spike up out of the skin. <clears throat> and then you want to have a scissor ready as well because they're going to cut that spike off of the tubing and they'll probably trim it down a little bit. Um, this is an example of an active drain because it does have this white circular part. Um, it actually um, keeps suction on the drain and it will also serve as a reservoir to catch fluid as well. Um, over here on the top right is a Jackson Pratt drain, or we call it a JP drain a lot of times. Um, it is also an active drain. It has this bulb on it that serves to keep suction on the wound um, and also serves as a reservoir to catch fluid. Bottom left, these are passive drains. These are all Penrose drains. And they come in different sizes, quarter inch, half inch, one inch, and so on. And uh, then bottom right is going to be our Pluravac drain or our water sealed <clears throat> drainage. And uh, this is for thoracic drains. So uh, if you've ever heard of a chest tube, um, if somebody has a chest tube, then this is the type of drainage device that's going to be hooked to that chest tube. And again, this is an active type drain. Um, as far as dressings go, like I said, there's a variety of different types of dressings. Important to note that against the wound, we want to put something that's non-stick um, so that when the dressing does come off, it's not going to either tear the wound open or you know, stick to the wound, be painful for the patient, whatever. <clears throat> so with a three layer drain, uh, dressing, typically we'll put something called Telfa um, against the wound. It's uh, kind of a shiny type nonstick pad. And then maybe some four by four gauzes are gonna go on top of that. Maybe another absorbent pad and tape. Um, could be similar with a, um, an extremity dressing as well, except for we're going to hold those <clears throat> materials on with some sort of rolled uh, dressing and typically finish up with a nice bandage. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk a little bit about the classifications of wounds. <clears throat> Wound classification, um, I think we've talked about before, um, wounds are classified by their level of um, um, potential to be infected, all right? So um, uh, uh, a wound that is classified as a number one is um, we're not expecting to see any type of um, surgical site infection at all, but a type four wound, uh, we would um, almost 100% expect to see some sort of contamination. So there are three different ways that wounds heal. Um, the first one is called primary intention. And primary intention is when the wound edges are brought together and we staple them or we um, suture them, um, but we close the wound, all right? That's primary intention. Secondary intention, we are not going to suture the wound, but we're going to leave it open and allow for it to um, heal via granulation. The third is a combination of the first two. Um, it's actually a delayed closure due to infection. Um, and then eventually, at some point, um, they will go back in and close the wound. So tissue repair. There are two different types of tissue repair. Um, the first type 
is called um, uh, is due to the parenchymal cells. And the parenchymal cells, they uh, this type of healing occurs due to the replication of those cells. So um, we've talked about in AMP about how the majority of the cells in our body replicate themselves, some more quickly than others, and some not at all. So the skin is going to be a cell that replicates itself really quickly. So epithelial <coughs> cells, <coughs> excuse me, um, um, cells of the mucous membranes, the fallopian tubes, um, the GI tract, the urinary tract, and the bone. Permanent cells, they can't heal themselves. And a good example is the nervous system. Um, muscles um, do uh, repair themselves, but it's very slowly. Um, but typically, um, a lot of this um, healing is due to scar tissue that takes the place of that tissue. Um, <clears throat> so the phases of healing. Three different types of three different phases of healing. The first phase is the inflammatory phase. So, if anytime you get a little cut or a poke or anything, and it starts to get red, that is indicative of the inflammatory phase. It's going to get red. It could be painful and hot, um, and that is when um, the healing begins. A scab is going to form, and usually that's within three to four days. The proliferative phase is um, starts within about four to five days and lasts for a couple weeks. And that's when that collagen matrix is starting to really reinforce that wound. And you're probably going to see the scab start to come off. And then that last phase is kind of a continuous phase called the remodeling phase. And the collagen is absorbed um, at this point. Um, a scar is going to form. It could be a keloid type scar. This happens, um, starts to happen at about week three, and it could possibly continue for um, a long period of time. Some conditions that affect healing, and we, these aren't new to us, um, but one's immune system, right? If, if, if one is immunocompromised, that's definitely going to affect the healing process. If they have chronic diseases like diabetes or cardiovascular issues, that is also going to affect healing. One's nutrition and overall health um, uh, is, is also going to impact as well as obesity and age could also lead um, to wound complications as well. Um, or to conditions that affect healing, I'm sorry. Um, and then uh, lastly, wound complications. Wound complications could include surgical site infections, the development of a seroma or a hematoma, dehiscence, evisceration, or ad the development of adhesions. So here's an example on the left side of an evisceration. Evisceration means your entrails have become extrails. All right, whatever is inside, the wound has opened, and now the contents from inside is protruding to the outside. This typically happens in the abdomen. And then on the right side, this is an example of a dehiscence. So a dehiscence doesn't necessarily mean the entrails are extrails. It just means that the wound um, part of it has come open. Okay. Um, example of a seroma here on the left. Remember, dead space is just um, uh, an opportunity for fluid to fill that space, and then we have some sort of seroma. So it's um, it, it could be a pinkish tinged fluid, but for the most part, it's it's um, a more clearish type fluid that's filling the space. And then on the right side, this is a, a classic example of a hematoma. So um, it could be you know anytime you get a bruise. Um, and it gets purple and blue and black and all those fun colors, that is a hematoma. 
It might not be one as severe as this that needs to be evacuated, but it is a hematoma. So when um, a hematoma occurs, it's blood that has collected and congealed um, within that space. And um, like you can see here, sometimes it does need to be evacuated. Okay, so that is going to take us to the end of our lecture regarding um, wound management. Um, you know, there we could spend months unpacking everything in this chapter. So um, I know it's a lot of information. Suffice it to say that we are going to continue to learn about sutures and learn about dressings and implants and um, hemostatic agents and all of those fun things as we continue through our program. Um, I look forward to hearing and answering your muddy points so make sure you discuss those with your group and let me know what those are so that i can help clear up anything that seems confusing thanks for listening